Um, so we read a paper entitled Nanomechanics of Tip-Link Coherence. And, oh, sorry. Yeah, I forgot. I have control. Um, and, yeah, it's about uh, um, hearing and then a deafness mutation. So we included a little bit about ourselves. I'm Caroline. Um, I'm from Ann Arbor, and I enjoy napping, uh, holiday-based uh, apparel, and onesies. Um, and then I also enjoy onesies, and sharks are my favorite animals. And then I enjoy the beach as much as possible, if you can tell that the second picture is from the beach. And eating is um, a great part of life. And then this is my little... Uh, personal connection to this is basically that uh, my dad's mom has super bad hearing and my dad's starting to realize that he has super bad hearing too and it kind of starts as like there's a range in which if there's noises at in that pitch range it gives him a headache and whenever I get excited or I speak too fast my voice goes up a bit so I literally give my dad a headache when I talk sometimes um, so that's my personal connection <laughs> And then, um, so this is the abstract they gave. You don't have to read it all. I'm going to go through and hit all the high points. Um, but basically, whenever you move your head or whenever there's, you hear anything, um, so for balance and for hearing, so sound waves are moving your head, there's, like a, there's a transduction of mechanical stimuli in the hair cells in your ear. Um, and that converts that movement, either sound wave or moving your head, into uh, an electrical uh, stimulus that your brain can understand and interpret. Um, and so basically in your ear you have an endolymph, which is kind of like the fluidy stuff that your hair cells are exposed to. And then in those hair cells you have uh, stereocilia, which pop up kind of like this little thing that I put up here, where one is taller than the next one is taller than the next one. And then connecting the tips of all those, there's something called a tip link, which that tip link is made of cadherin 23 and proto cadherin 15. And they're both dimers and it kind of ends up being like a rope or a tether in between the two. Um, with cadherin connects to the tall one and then pro proto cadherin connected to the shorter one and then both those Cadherins are connected together in between. Um, and so basically, in order for you to hear and in order for everything to work properly, you need tension between those so that way when the taller um, stereocilia moves, it pulls on the lower one, opening up a channel. And this cadherin is a bit different than normal cadherins that we've learned about in this class because it has a lot more um, calcium domains. It has 27 of them, um, as well as it. Whoa! And it has a lot, uh, it works at a way lower calcium level. So it's different. Yeah, so 27, so that's however many there were before. Um, and so basically this paper focuses on cadherin um, and both its nanomechanics at low calcium levels. And then also it talks about um, a deafness point mutation called D101G. Um, and it kind of talks about how that changes the nanomechanics, but Caroline will get a little bit more into that in the next slide. So here are models. Um, you can see that there's two stereocilia on hair cells of the inner ear, which is represented by the big uh, backwards U's. And uh, the blue horizontal lines at the bottom represent lateral connections between the stereocilia. And at the top, you could see that cadherins, there's the proto-cadherin 15 and the cadherin 23 that are both cis dimer ectodomains and they are connected through a trans interaction. And at rest, you can see the MET channel, the mechanoelectrical transduction channel is closed. But upon stimulation that generates force and tension between the cadherins, it uh, stimulates the met channel to open open and for the picture on the right you can see a model of how they designed the um, d101g mutation so it shows a pfs1 vector containing ubiquitin which are the u proteins 
as single molecule markers to characterize the individual cadherin and protocadherin ectodomains. And then EC1 and EC2 are both um, ectodomains of the cadherin 23. And it's important to note that the protocadherin isn't um, present in this because they couldn't get them to fold properly. And so they didn't uh, exhibit any uh, nanomechanic quality or mechanical, you know, or what was it, mechanical properties. So it couldn't be analyzed. Can, can I, I just need a little help orientating myself here. So we had three cadherins initially, and now we only have two. So which one do we take out? Do we take out the middle one? For, no, the those are just both domains of the cadherin 20. Three. So this is all 23? Yeah, this is all cadherin 23 because they couldn't uh, fold the proto-cadherin. So, so EC1 is the extracellular um, calcium coordination site one on cadherin 23, and then EC2 is the extracellular calcium coordination site two on cadherin 23. Where would like the transmembrane part be? Is it? Way... Uh, Over there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm. I'm not super familiar with like. Uh, I'm a little confused. I guess. Yeah. So it'd be over to the right, but you can't see it in this. Image. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so this is not. This is all showing like the. This is just showing like the calcium bound in between these linkers. What are we? I don't really know what we're looking. Yeah. So this is like a zoomed in picture of the PF the PFS vector. Yeah. And so you can see the two domains on um, either side and the mechanical clamps are the parts that can become unraveled due to the point mutation, which is in uh, the D101G. And this and the calcium rivets are what help stabilize the um, domains and they help, they serve as sacrificial mechanical resistance between the domains that become unfolded when there's tension. Mic. Sorry, somebody's mic is really... Carolyn, is your mic working now? I think my mic it should be working. Okay, yeah, now it sounds better. But yeah, basically the calcium rivet, as she just said, but I'm not sure if you guys could hear her, it works as a sacrificial sort of um, place where if there's too much tension or force, the calcium rivet would unfold before the actual proteins, um, extracellular calcium domain unfolds. So it's like a little tension kind of buffer. Yeah. And so this mutation is affecting that clamp somehow? So the mutation affects the affinity that calcium can bind with. Um, so it lowers okay. the and they don't, they didn't talk about the exact reason why that affinity affects the rivets, but they did say that um, the calcium rivets work better at, or I guess they kind of grew, that the calcium rivets work better um, when there's higher binding affinity. And so the hydrogen bonds that are the like ladder looking things for the mechanical clamps are what become broken and unfolded if the calcium rivet isn't becoming unfolded first. I see, yeah. So the calcium rivet acts as that buffer to yeah. hold things together to adhere things. And then that, if we perturb that, then we're messing up the structure of the protein, mm -hmm. these mechanical clamps. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Anybody else have any questions about this model? Thank you for explaining all that for me. So for the method of how they did the experiment, they uh, cloned the ectodomains and expressed them in uh, HEC-293 cells. And they used substrates uh, to bind the domain. They didn't, uh, and that's uh, shown at the bottom in the tan color, which uh, binds to the full-length ectodomain which you could see the cadherin 23, but they also used it for the PFS1 vector that we just went over that shows the D101G mutation. And then they used um, a single molecule force spectroscopy and a length clamp to represent displacement in the D, uh, 
in the Z direction to stimulate tension between the coherence. So the first experiment that they looked at, this is their main experiment of looking at the, what they call nanomechanics of coherin. Um, and starting off over here on the left is that same system they just set up. Um, they're pulling on the coherent and they're looking for this pattern in um, how much force it can take before the length shifts. They're looking for this, what they call a um, sawtooth pattern. And basically what the sawtooth pattern is, is every time you get that large dip, um, it means that one of the ecto domains, or the ECs, one of those um, EC domains has unfolded. Um, and they're looking at it at different calcium levels. So the top one is a, uh, it's, there's no calcium in it. It's a different solution called EGTA, and it's just their control. Um, and then they're looking at, at 30 micromolar, which is, um, what they call the low physiological one that like this works at, which is very low, um, but this cadherin works and usually operates around this physiological level of calcium. And then they do it at higher calcium levels as well at 301 uh, micromolar. And yeah, so right here, they're looking for the sawtooth pattern, which they see. Um, and you can see as it gets lower, so does the sawtooth pattern, but you can't really see the sawtooth pattern at all in the um I just want to ask a clarifying question for myself again. So that sawtooth pattern, I think it's cool. So it's like they're pulling on the cat here and, and then it reaches some threshold and that calcium rivet releases. Is that what's happening? So that I'll get into that a little bit more in a second, but any of these big jumps you see are actually going to be the um the uh EC domain unfold. The e so the actual EC domain is, is on. Yeah. So with a lot of tension, the EC domains will unfold. Okay. And this is like hundreds. Yeah. This is like 50 piconewtons of force, and then they're unfolding something like that. 100 yeah. piconewtons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's pretty high. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, that's around like cytokinesis levels, I think. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and then. They're looking over here at the change in length, they call it the contour length. So over at this left side, and basically what they did is they um, added all of the changes in lengths together um, and then put them as kind of a, it looks like a histogram, but it's just a char, chart. Um, and then any of the things that are um, colored in, that's when the rivet is unfolding versus later, you can see a larger change in um, length when the EC domain unfolds. So here you only get like less than 10 nanometers of change. And then here you get 30 to 40 nanometers of change when the um, EC domain unfolds. So the colored in, throughout all of this, the colored in is going to be the um, rivet. And then this is when the EC unfolds. And then going down here, oh, sorry, I'm not sure if you guys Okay. Yeah, going down to the bottom left, that's just um, them putting uh, all of those together. And you can see that the um, rivets unfolding usually happens more to the left versus the um, EC domains happen more to the right, meaning that it takes more force for the EC domains to unfold than and the rivets unfold at a lower force. Um, then D is zoomed in actually to this. Um, one micromole calcium and it's zoomed in and basically you can see like a little peak before the large peak and that little peak is the calcium rivet unfolding and then the larger peak is the EC domain unfolding. Um, and then over here on B, this is when they start looking at the mutant. And so what's that, so what's that third peak, that whole, that WLC this? fit? Yeah, yeah. Do you mean what's the WLC fit? So the WLC fit is the green lines. Okay. And that's just some math that they use to calculate everything out. Gotcha. Really and, then, yeah. and then what's that delta L like between those two peaks? The again? delta L is um, what they showed up here, which is that contour length. Yeah. So, I don't really understand that, but that's okay. We can keep, <laughs> we can keep, I didn't, I, yeah, it's just like, this is like a fancy magic way to show data that I've never seen before. So I'd have to get in here and understand it, but I really like these sawtooth graphs that really, yeah. 
this, that this data is really nice. It's cool. Looking. And I'll make sure to uh, point out all the important parts. Um, cool. So over here, they're looking at their mutant, that D101G mutant. And basically what they notice is that at high calcium levels, um, nothing really changes. They still have that calcium rivet that drops down before you get that large drop. Um, so you can still see a calcium rivet unfolding. It's all good at one micromolar and at 300, uh, mic or one millimolar and then 300 micromolar calcium. But then once you get down to the physiological level of the ear, um, there's a shift to the left in the graph, meaning that it's taking less force for it to unfold and you are no longer getting those rivets anymore. Um, so you're just getting the EC domains unfolding. That's pretty cool. And then uh, Caroline will talk more about the unit. Yeah, so starting on the right, it's um, a histogram of the wild, the top picture for C is a histogram of the wild type of the domain EC1 and 2. And the F values, like Abby explained, are calcium rivets, and they're shown in the solid bars are the calcium rivets, and the unfolded domains themselves are the unfolding protein domains. And you can see that the calcium rivets are present at the wild type at around 100, uh, at 100 PN of force for all of the um, different physiological uh, or for all of the calcium levels and you can see upon a certain force that the calcium rivets are not helping anymore and the entire protein or the entire domains are unfolding because it's too much pressure for the rivets to provide because they only can you just orient like uh oh yeah like I'm, yeah i'm just lost a little bit where, where we're looking Oh yeah, for top C. Sorry, I just don't have the the mouse. Yeah, sorry. I'll try to point with the cursor as you're oh, talking. Oh good, I got it. I got it. Thank you. But you can see that there's calcium rivets for all of them before the it the the domain itself starts to unfold, which is the un the un solid lines. Yes, no, I got sure. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Got it. <laughs> Whereas for the D101G mutant for at physiological pH, was it, which is in the green, you don't see any of the calcium rivets. So it's just the protein unfolding at different amounts of force. Whereas when you go down to 300 or one uh, millimolar of calcium, you see more um, of the rivets similar to the wild type because the uh, affinity, it, the mutation uh, lowers the affinity for calcium. So by applying more calcium, the domains are being, um, are getting the calcium they need, just like it takes longer. Whereas on E, you can see the change in length as well. And it shows the contour length between the unfolding peaks. And for the wild type, you notice that they're all grouped together, meaning that they have a uniform rate of unfolding due to the calcium rivets providing stability for the domains. And so the domains aren't unfolding spontaneously. Whereas in the mutant, at physiological pH, there's not enough calcium because the affinity is so low. So you see more peaks in between the larger peaks but when you provide more calcium, as in like the blue or the purple, those peaks are gone because the domains are saturated with calcium at the higher levels. So this indicates that calcium binds to the wild type protein, which strengthens the domain against mechanical unfolding at physiological conditions. Whereas in the mutant, there is high unfolding at calcium levels for the at physiological concentrations. So we can deduce that D101G reduces calcium bond binding, which compromises the mechanical response, which is shown in the change in length of the unfolding proteins. And this suggests that the mutation creates a sensitivity to calcium concentrations. Uh, and one important thing that I think uh, I meant to know in the last one but basically there's two types of unfolding. There's canalized unfolding and canalized. 
unfolding is kind of like the organized unfolding where the rivet unfolds before the EC domain um, versus decanalyzed unfolding is what's happening in the mutant where the rivet doesn't unfold first and it kind of decreases the force needed for it to unfold. Um, I have a little question here. Yeah. So, you know, in our wild type, so in E, just like in that green, on those green, yeah, those ones, you know, just comparing those. So we have these different unfolding styles, but what, like, what would that actually result in for, like, signal transmission? You know, is this just, like, noise? Like, is the mutant just kind of, like, noise then? Like, always kind of being activated, even it's when it's shouldn't be like what well, yeah it's really interesting so the mutant changes the orientation of the calcium and so that unravels the uh cadherin bonds which we're going to show in our model but it creates the, um, no more tension and it dissolves the bond between the uh mm. different cadherins so yeah. they no longer are able to produce tension and it's why we saw no uh, at rest we didn't see um the channel opening because there is no tension developed because that, they've that unraveled. Yes, because because cadherin is similar to um, myosin uh, catch bond. You know, this is also you need a little bit of force to bind to each other. Yeah, go ahead. This is also like a specific type of deafness, so it's not it doesn't work the same necessarily in all cases. Like in some, there's more of a um, like you hear differently first, like kind of like what my dad has like you hear things differently in different yeah. ways. Um, this is more like of a breakdown of the link between them um, where the link can't really hold that tension so it unravels and we'll get to later how that can just break the um, yeah. link. But this is called DFNB12 hereditary deafness. That's what type of deafness this is. Cool. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. Okay. So for our model basically they had a, a four-part model and we kind of um, rearranged it to more fit what we thought would work better. Um, so this is kind of, they had two parts to explain this. We thought it only really needed one. So this is like the hearing part, the nothing's mutated part um, of the model. So basically you have, um, this is all taking place in the endolymph. Um, one of the things we did versus their models, you maybe label more things, which they don't really do. Um, but anyways, you're in the endolymph and you have a hair cell and then there's a stereocilia coming up from the hair cell. Um, and cadherin 23 is attached to the upper, uh, or the taller stereocilia and connects via um, calcium two, and you have calcium two, cal or via calcium um, rivets in between all of here. Um, so calcium rivets are in between each of these little bubbles, I guess you could say, um, which these bubbles represent the EC domains. And then you have a trans interaction in between the cadherin and the protocadherin, and the protocadherin is then attached um, to the membrane of the lower adjacent stereocilia. And when you have that tension, then this is going to open the channel. Um, and that tension could be due to a sound movement or a head movement, which is going to send oscillations through the end of it. And so this shows the mutated model, where uh, if you look at the first circle that's at the top, you can see how there is the mutation, which results in the uh, unraveling of the cadherin itself. And over time, this can result in the loss of the uh, interaction, the trans interaction between both the protocadherin 15 and the cadherin 23. And then if you go to our larger model, it shows that because there is that loss in, um, of the interaction between them, there is no tension and the MET channel will be closed. It also, the paper didn't get into this, but we saw, or they saw that there was um, the unfolding of the cadherin. So what we did was we did straight lines instead of intertwined lines like are present in the protocadherin proto 15. And this is just to show that the lines were unfolded and not intertwined. And then we also wanted to show that the lines were kind of, um, 
squiggly in the overtime picture as well because they have a loss in rigidity due to this calcium change in co the coordination domain. Um, and then we have our future directions. So we found a paper that worked on tip length regeneration. So we think that would be a good way to improve this kind of deafness, but it takes a really long time. So they need to find ways to make it less time intensive by doing larger models of in vivo studies. And then in this study, they tried looking at other EC domains, but they weren't able to because um, they attached a marker to it in order to look at it. And it just wasn't working with EC domains that weren't EC, EC1 and EC2. So identifying other individual EC domains um, and using the same recording technique to study those mechanical effects on mutations to see if it's similar or different at all. We also thought it would be good to find ways to increase calcium levels in the endolymph because we did see a return in function in the mutants if the calcium levels were high enough, so the binding affinity was less important. Um, and then a less uh, for sure way of doing it is just finding some other way to basically tie the tip, um, the tips back together. So another way to generate tension in the ear. Um, but right now we're talking about a cellular level, so that, that's pretty far away. Um, and then this is the, our one sentence summary that we took away from this is at low physiological calcium levels, D10G, D101G mutated cat hearing shows lower calcium binding affinity leading to decanalyzed, which is again the rivet unfolding, or the rivet not unfolding before the EC domain, um, leading to decanalyzed uh, mechanical unfolding to no longer allow for the opening of the adjacent channel by use of tension. And so for it is a discussion activity, we thought, how could you model the opening and closing of a channel with tension using household items? And then we designed um, a model to show the tension, if you guys have any ideas of how you would do it first. And then we'll show you guys ours. And Caroline, do you want to make sure that I have yeah. to play it? Also, any questions that you guys have about anything in general? I'm confused because they worked this morning. If you screen share it, would it work? Um, we'll try it while people are in breakout rooms. Uh, don't join any of those breakout rooms. They, they put you all in separate breakout rooms. So, can people hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear. Okay, people. Okay, I wasn't sure if I got. We can also do it as a group discussion. It yeah, let's just do it as a group then, because we're already over. So let's. Uh, does anybody have any ideas of some uh, household items we could use to connect together and like that would have like a release style? you know, interactions with each other that like do like like that. I'm thinking a lot about like like bread ties, like those little like twist tie things, maybe. If you like connected a bunch of those together, that would be a, maybe a good, because like they're springy and you could like put different clay around them or something that'd be like calcium rivets i'm not something like that maybe for me for me it can also be a model of like the larger ear opening channel in general oh sorry i was i didn't even read either one smaller or <laughs> I didn't read your question how could you model opening and closing of a channel 
We can try to show you guys what we came up with. Let me see if this works. Yeah, go on. Go ahead. Maybe it won't work. Caroline, do you want to try to see if you can play the video? Do you just, do, yeah, who has the video on their computer? Do, do either of you just can. Or do we only have it on the cloud? Oh, look at that. What? Y'all did some garage trash can work. I see. I can't hear. We can't hear you. Yeah, I think I think you're muted if you're touch, if you're trying to touch. So what we did was we took two trash cans and there's a rope in between the two trash cans to simulate the tension. And so when there's the tension between the two, the lid is open. And so, as you can see, Joe. when we, <laughs> so the channel's open, so <laughs> things can go in, and that stimulates the MET channel, but the uh, mutation results in a unraveling of the coherent, which results in the breaking of the tension, so no tension can be generated, so that's similar to the channel will be closed because the rope is broken. Can, I, can you go back to the first video? I don't. I don't see the rope. Where's the? Is it just? Yeah, it's kind of hard to see with the angle, yeah. but like you can see it tied at the top. Okay. So and it's just tied it, to that lid. Yeah, and then it's around the lid of the second trash can. Cool. And the little the cans that you're throwing represent the ions. Yeah, going into the met channel. That's cool. All right. Um, is that was that all you had? Is that your end? Yeah, that's the end. That's our awesome. Um, great. Uh, everyone on mute. Let's do our claps. Yay! All our